Hi, everyone. Welcome back to Chapter 8. This is now 8.2, Part 2. We're still covering testing a claim about a proportion specifically. So in 8.2, Part 1, we got through some of these key concepts. Now in 8.2, Part 2, we'll cover using hypothesis testing via the critical value method. After covering those two additional methods, we'll look a little bit more about how we can use Excel for hypothesis testing. So we'll see that towards the end of this lecture. Let's keep in mind where we're at with this flowchart of steps. So in 8.2 part one, we went through all of the steps and at step six, we use the p-value method. As mentioned today in 8.2 part two, we'll cover the critical value method. Notice that for both ways we could approach step six, we needed to figure out what test statistic we need to calculate and we needed to calculate that. We remember for proportions specifically, our test statistic we need to calculate is that Z value. So we already calculated the Z value in 8.2 part one. So for a reminder on that, you can go back to that portion, but we're not gonna calculate the test statistic again today. So let's move forward today, starting at step six, using the critical value method rather than the p-value method. One note that's really important to make here is that our test statistic, the z-value, is absolutely not the same thing as our critical value. When we first learned about critical values, we learned about a z alpha over two for a normal distribution, and we learned about a t alpha over two for a student t distribution. As a refresher on that definition, a critical value is the number on the borderline separating sample statistics that are significantly high or low from those that are not significant. To visualize this, we could have this normal distribution and then this area here on the left are the values that are significantly low. This tail on the right here then is the values that are significantly high. All these values here in yellow in the middle then are the ones that are not significant. Now connecting this to chapter eight, this should look familiar as a two-tailed test and we'll talk more about why that's important. Remembering the notation we used initially for a critical value, that's z alpha over 2, where the critical value is our z-score with the property that it's at the border that separates an area of alpha over 2 here in this standard normal distribution. So in this two-tailed test, this right tail is an area of alpha over 2. Our critical value then was the z-score that separated this area of alpha over two from the remainder of the area in our standard normal distribution curve. We keep in mind when doing this with a standard normal distribution that the total area under the curve adds up to one. Now, again, it's important to see that this is a two-tailed test, right? Where we have this area of alpha over two on the left, and we have that same area of alpha over two on the right. Then the notation for our critical value is a Z alpha over two, because we took our alpha value, we divided that by two. That gave us our area of just alpha over two. Then to find this cumulative area from the left, we took one, the total area under the curve, minus that alpha over two, because when working with Excel and table A2, we need to think in terms of cumulative area from the left. So this is for a two-tailed test, and for a normal distribution, our critical value notation was Z alpha over two. Now, I mentioned that specifically because when we have a two-tailed test again, we have this area on the left and this area on the right. However, for a left-tailed test and a right-tailed test, we only have this one concentrated area of alpha. For a left-tailed test, that concentrated area of alpha is on the left-hand side. For a right-tailed test, that concentrated area of alpha is on the right-hand side. So notice that for both the left-tailed and the right-tailed test, we don't need to divide alpha by two. Alpha is this whole area here, this whole right-hand tail, and alpha here for a left-tailed test is this left tail. It's only for a two-tailed test that we took our alpha value and divided that by two in order to find our critical value or Z alpha over two.
When we have just a left tail test or a right tail test, rather than denoting this as Z alpha over two, we can denote this as just Z alpha for our critical value. So again, the area in green, that's always alpha. So here, alpha over two is on the left-hand side. Alpha over two is also on the right-hand side. Therefore, our critical value is denoted as Z alpha over two. For a left tail test and a right tail test though, alpha is this entire area here on the left tail and on the right tail. Then when we find our critical value, we denote that as Z alpha. Connecting this more so to our hypothesis test, we remember this definition here, where the critical value separates the critical region where we reject the null hypothesis from the values of the test statistic that do not lead to rejection of the null hypothesis. So what we'll end up doing for a critical value method is comparing our test statistic value to the critical value that we get here, either for a two-tailed, left-tailed, or right-tailed test. Let's come back to this example we've been using of the claim that most consumers are uncomfortable with drone deliveries. Now here we're starting with the critical value method and we're starting at step six. So we're not gonna go back and find that Z test statistic of 2.55 if you need a refresher on how we got that, be sure to go back to 8.2 part one. So we have our test statistic. We're gonna set that aside from now as we calculate our critical value. Coming back again here really quickly, if you need a refresher on how we decided that that drone example was an example of a right tailed test, again, you can go back to 8.2 part one. In order to determine the tailedness of our test, we look at the symbol notation that's in our alternative hypothesis or H1. For this drone example, we had an alternative hypothesis that has that greater than symbol. That's how we know we're working with a right tailed test. Why is that important here? Well, we know that for a right tailed test, this alpha is all concentrated on the right hand side of the distribution. Then the cumulative area from the left would be everything aside from alpha. So if this is our alpha value, we could take one minus our alpha area to get this area to the left. So let's do that now in Excel. So remember for table A2 and using Excel, we need to think in terms of cumulative area from the left. So setting this up in Excel, here's our significance value or alpha. I take one, the total area under the curve, minus just alpha to get 0.95. Notice that for a right tail test, I did not divide alpha by two. I just took my alpha value, then I took one minus my alpha value to get that cumulative area to the left. If it were a two tailed test, we would need to divide alpha by two, but here we have a one tailed test, a right tailed test. So we just took alpha as is, then one minus alpha, that's 0.95. That 0.95 is our cumulative area from the left, so we can work with that area when using Excel and table A2. So we have our probability slash area value. What we also need in working with Excel is to understand that we estimated this, we approximated this as a standard normal distribution. So we have our probability slash area value, that's the cumulative area from the left. Now, what we also need for Excel is to know our mean and our standard deviation. As we just talked about with a critical value and working with a Z critical value, that's approximating our data as a standard normal distribution. We need to remember that because then that tells us our meaning for the mean and our value for our standard deviation. So our mean then for a standard normal distribution is zero, and then our standard deviation for a standard normal distribution is equal to one. Flipping through our mental catalog of what Excel functions we know so far. So if we have our probability slash area value, we have a mean and we have a standard deviation, and we just wanna know that corresponding Z value that separates this area on the left-hand side from the remainder of the area under the curve or the distribution, then the function that will give us that answer is a normal inverse function. 
What we need for that is the corresponding probability or area that's cumulative from the left, our mean and our standard deviation. That will give us that Z value or that X value that corresponds to this given probability or area value. That will give us our corresponding X or Z value that corresponds to this probability slash area value. So we type in equal sign N-O-R-M dot I-N-V, then the probability slash area value that was just one minus alpha, not one minus alpha over two, right? Because we have a right tailed test. So we just took alpha and took one minus alpha to find this cumulative area to the left. When we click enter here, we'll get this critical value of 1.645. Coming back to this figure here, we had our alpha value. We took one minus alpha to get this cumulative area to the left. Then knowing that we have a standard normal distribution, we had a mean of zero and a standard deviation of one. Using the normal inverse function then in Excel, we got our critical value. We got that value here that separates this left-hand side of the area from the right-hand side. That's how we calculated our critical value of Z is equal to 1.645. Remember, you can think of this as sort of an X or a Z axis, and then that Z value is what separates this area on the left from this right tail on the right. You'll notice that all we needed for that critical value calculation is an alpha value of 0.05 and to understand that we have a standard normal distribution, which then gives us our mean value and our standard deviation. Using Excel then, we came up with a critical value of Z alpha is equal to 1.645. Let's now talk through how we'd solve that using table A2. Now, again, for either table A2 or for Excel, we did need to calculate that test statistic of Z is equal to 2.55. We have not yet used this in our critical value method, but we will when we're making the interpretation in step seven and eight. Importantly, again, this test statistic value of Z equal to 2.55 is not our critical value. So now we'll proceed with calculating our critical value, not using Excel, but using table A2. We go through the same thought process. So, okay, our alpha value is 0.05. Is that split up into alpha over two and alpha over two because we have a two-tailed test? Or is that alpha area all focused on either the right-hand side for a right-tailed test or on the left-hand side for a left-tailed test? Well, here for our drone example, remember we're dealing with a right tailed test. So all that alpha is on the right tail. We can visualize this as looking at a normal distribution that is in a right tailed test. Then this area here is our alpha. Notice that we don't have two regions of alpha. So we don't need to divide alpha by two. This area here is alpha is equal to 0.05. Now for Excel and table A2, we think in cumulative area to the left. So we don't use this alpha of 0.05 as our area, but instead we take one minus 0.05. Okay, so as mentioned, we need to think in terms of cumulative area from the left. How do we get that value? We take the total area under the curve. So that's one minus our alpha value minus that area to get a cumulative area from the left of 0.95. So now we use that area of 0.95 and looking at table A2. Remember the setup for table A2, so we have all those probability and area values in the bulk of the table. Then the corresponding z-scores to those probability and area values are in the column and then on the top portion, the top row of table A2. So in this scenario now, in solving for the critical value using table A2, we have our probability slash area value and we wanna find that corresponding z-score. We saw this method initially in 6.1, so for more of a review, feel free to go back to 6.1. Again, I've posted a condensed version of this table A2 where there would normally be more values here between our top row and then 1.6. Here, I just cut down what information we really need to focus on. 
Remember, we're looking at a probability slash area value of 0 0.95. So we need to first find that in the table to then find the corresponding z-score. What you may remember in doing this is for a value of 0.95, it's in between 1.64 and 1.65. So because this area of 0.95 is between 1.64 and 1.65, then we need to take the mean of 1.64 and 1.65. When we do so then using table A2, we still get this critical value of 1.645. So to find this critical value in step six, we can either use Excel or table A2 to find this critical value or Z alpha. Remember we're calling it Z alpha because we have a right tailed test. If we had a two tailed test, we would call it Z alpha over two. And again, for this area 0.95, it's not listed directly in table A2. So we needed to take the mean of the values that it's in between. So we have our critical value. We also have that test statistic, that Z value. We very importantly remember that our test statistic, that Z value is absolutely not the same thing as our critical value, or in this case, our Z alpha value. Let's visualize all this before moving on to the interpretation. Our original claim is that the majority of consumers are uncomfortable with drone delivery, so then our null hypothesis became P is equal to 0.5. Then in terms of Z, because we're dealing with a standard normal distribution, then the middle point here is Z is equal to zero. That's our mean. When we calculated that test statistic, the Z value, we got Z is equal to 2.55. Then for our critical value method in step six, we use an alpha significance value of 0.05 to find our critical value of 1.645. It's really recommended that we draw this out on the same distribution so then we can compare our critical value that we just found and our test statistic, our Z value. Why do we want to draw this out? Well, we're going to end up comparing the placement of our test statistic to our critical value. So let's move on to step seven and talk about the interpretation here. Keep in mind for our p-value method, we compared our p-value to our alpha value to then say, do we reject the null hypothesis or do we fail to reject the null hypothesis? For the critical value method, we can't do that because we don't have a p-value to work with. Instead, we have a critical value. So to execute step seven, instead of thinking about p-value versus alpha, we instead think about does the test statistic fall within the critical region? If the test statistic does fall in that critical region, then we reject the null hypothesis. If the test statistic does not fall in the critical region, then we fail to reject the null hypothesis. Because we decided to draw this out, we can more easily see that our test statistic does fall within this critical region. Remember our terminology here where this critical value will be the borderline between this area here and this area here. Where this area here for a right tailed test is considered our critical region. So then again, because the test statistic does fall within our critical region, that means we reject the null hypothesis. Here's the same visual again. It's really important to keep in mind the thought process that goes behind step seven for the critical value method compared to the p-value method. But what you'll see is that with the p-value method and the critical value method, we end up getting the same conclusion in the end. The times when we don't get the same conclusion is when we start to use the confidence interval method, but comparing the critical value method and the p-value method, we will get the same conclusion for those two. So again, from step seven, we say we reject the null hypothesis. Moving on to step eight and making a conclusion, well, we ask the same questions as we did for our p-value method. As a reminder, those two questions were, do we reject the null hypothesis or do we fail to reject the null hypothesis? 
That was the first question. Then the second question, does our original claim include unequality? Let's answer those questions for our specific case, keeping in mind that we should get the same exact conclusion, whether we use the critical value method or the p-value method. For this first question, we did decide in step seven to reject the null hypothesis. For the second question, this should be the same answer we saw in 8.2 part one. So our original claim does not contain inequality. Why is that? Well, going back to 8.2 part one, our original claim is that P is greater than 0.5. There is no equality symbol in our original claim. So then we look at the table, keeping in mind that we reject the null hypothesis and our original claim does not contain inequality. This should look familiar here because now we're again in this row where we say the original claim does not include inequality and we rejected the null hypothesis. The corresponding conclusion then is that there is sufficient sample evidence to support the claim that, and we insert our original claim here. Therefore, for our current drone example about most consumers being uncomfortable with drone deliveries, we make the same conclusion as we did using the p-value method as we're doing here for the critical value method. We therefore conclude that there is sufficient sample evidence to support the claim that most or more than half or a majority of consumers are uncomfortable with drone deliveries. So in 8.2 part one, we went through the p-value method. Now in 8.2 part two so far, we've gone through the critical value method. You'll notice that we get the same conclusion for either one. And we didn't split off between the critical value method and the p-value method until we got to step six. Then again, we come back to making the same conclusion for either method that we could have selected. So now we've covered in hypothesis testing how to use the p-value method, critical value method, and the confidence interval method. Now we're going to somewhat switch gears here and talk about finding the number of successes or X and how do we calculate that? This is sort of synonymous to what we saw in chapter seven, where we first covered the main calculations, then we talked about how do we actually calculate for a sample size? So now in 8.2, we're gonna cover this other sort of style of question of finding the number of successes or X. So what we saw for hypothesis tests of proportion specifically and using Excel, we had to put in numbers for our sample size N and also calculate our P hat value based on the number of successes X and our total number of samples. Again, that equation was taking P hat is equal to X over N. Though in some examples, we won't actually be given X and N, instead we'll be given a P hat value directly for our sample proportion. But using that same equation I just mentioned of P hat is equal to X divided by N, we could solve for the number of successes X if we know our value for N, the number of samples, and we know our P hat, the sample proportion. So this would be our equation for solving for the number of successes X if we didn't know that and we wanted to know that in our problem. One note in calculating this number of successes X is sometimes we'll have to round. So as you'll see in the next example, we'll get a result of 5,587.712. We'll end up rounding that to 5,588. It depends on the setup of the question. Here we're rounding because we can't have a decimal number of people, a decimal number of adults. So then we end up rounding this up to be 5,588 number of people out of our total sample size n. So a key takeaway when calculating the number of successes x is sometimes we'll have to round. We might get an original number here from this formula and then we'd have to round it for our correct final answer. I will note that this might feel fairly intuitive rather than wanting to use a calculation, but let's use the calculation to find out why it feels intuitive. For example, in a study of sleepwalking, we have information that 29.2% of about 19,000 American adults have sleepwalked. 
Then intuitively or with this formula, we can calculate the actual number of adults who have sleepwalked. What are we really finding here? That's 29.2% of this total number of American adults. Let's solve for this. So we want to know 29.2% of 19,136. The first thing we need to do is get 29.2 out of a percentage. So we take 29.2 divided by 100, that's 0 0.292. Now, again, this may feel intuitive, but here's our formula to find the number of successes X, where that's equal to our total number of samples N, multiplied by p hat, our sample proportion. So coming back here to the solution, here's our total number of samples, n, so 19,136. Our p hat here in a non-percentage is 0.292. Then to find the number of successes x, which is really just finding 29.2% of about 19,000, we get that by multiplying n, our sample size, times 0.292. That gives us x number of successes as 5,587.712. It doesn't really make sense to have a decimal number of adults, so we end up rounding that up to 5,588. Again, you may be able to think about this intuitively. That's totally fine. Also, if you want to use this equation, you're more than welcome to do so as well. It really comes down to finding 29.2% of a certain number, and we get that percentage out of a percentage and into a decimal form first. Then we multiply that decimal form by the total number of samples we have, and that's our answer. So, so far what you've seen, we had a majority or most consumers claim. We used a null hypothesis for that of P is equal to 0.5. One of the last things we'll do in 8.2 is cover a slightly different style of example problem. Here, our claim is going to be fewer than 30% of adults have sleepwalked. What we're gonna end up answering is with N equal to 19,136 and this P hat value of 29.2%, would a reporter be justified in stating that fewer than 30% of adults have sleepwalked? Remember what we're doing in questions like this, we're taking a sample, but we're trying to make inferences about a population. Because if we just looked at the sample data, we would say, well, of course, 29.2% is less than 30%. But that's not exactly what we're doing here. So we're taking sample data, then we're deciding, can we truly say that fewer than 30% of all adults have sleepwalked? For some more setup of this example, we're going to use a 0.05 significance level to test the claim that for the adult population, not just a sample, for the adult population, the proportion of those who have sleepwalked is less than 0 0.30. Where do we get that 0 0.30? Well, our initial claim is that fewer than 30% of adults have sleepwalked, so 30% in a decimal form is 0 0.30. Then in the next steps, we'll use this wording of fewer than 30%. Okay, so in here then we have an alpha value. We also then have a P value. Before diving right into the solution, we need to go through these requirement checks. So number one, is the sample a simple random sample? Well, we don't have any other information to think otherwise. So we will say this is a simple random sample. It's an unbiased sample. This would not be a simple random sample if we only pulled people coming out of a sleep clinic, for example. The second requirement is to check all those binomial distribution requirements. Within that binomial distribution requirement, do we have a fixed number of trials? Yes. Are they independent trials? Also yes. Are there two categories? Again, also yes. We have a subject that could have sleepwalked or has not sleepwalked. Then that third requirement is n times p greater than or equal to 5 and is n times q greater than or equal to 5. Be careful here because the p value we use is not the p hat value. The p value we use here is from our original claim. So then for number three, we still have our n number of people that we tested. 
But note that our p value is not our p hat value. Our p value is 0 0.30. That 0 0.30 came from our original claim of wondering if fewer than 30% of adults have sleepwalked. Then solving for q, we can get q is equal to 1 minus p, so q is 0 0.70. Then N times P or 19,136 times 0.3, that's definitely greater than or equal to five. N times Q, about 19,000 times 0.7, that's definitely also greater than or equal to five. So here, both of these requirements are checked and all three of these requirements are checked. So we can say that the three requirements are all satisfied. We should check these requirements before moving into our next steps. So now that we've done that, let's go into step one. We need to make our original claim in symbolic notation. Fewer than 30% of adults have sleepwalked. Well, 30% in decimal form is 0 0.30. Then fewer than 30% of adults, so P would be less than 0 0.30. Remember with our majority claim, we wanted P to be greater than 0.5 because we're looking at a majority or most of consumers. So we need to really pay attention to the wording in our original claim to then figure out this step one. Step two, denote all of the opposite cases to step one. So here in step one, P is less than 0.30. The other options is that P is equal to 0 0.30 or P is greater than 0 0.30. How we denote that symbolically is that the opposite of the original claim is P is greater than or equal to 0 0.30. In step three, we need to figure out what's our alternative hypothesis and what's our null hypothesis. Remember for the alternative hypothesis, we need to look at this from step one and this from step two. Then our alternative hypothesis is the one that doesn't have an equality. So from these two options, it's clear that P is less than 0 0.30. That does not contain an equality. Therefore, that's our alternative hypothesis. So here's our alternative hypothesis. We also keep in mind, this is our original claim that fewer than 30% of adults have sleepwalked. Now, what should our null hypothesis always contain? Well, that's an equal sign, right? So our null hypothesis is that P is equal to 0 0.30. We denote the null hypothesis as H naught and we denote the alternative hypothesis as H1. Now for step four, we were given the significance level to work with, so alpha is equal to 0 0.05. Step five, figure out what test statistic we need to calculate. We are still working with proportions, so we'll calculate that test statistic again as that Z value. As a reminder, that Z value can be calculated like this, so P hat minus P all over the square root of P times Q over N. So from step five, because we're dealing with a proportion, we know we need to calculate this test statistic of a Z value. Then at step six, do we want to take the p-value method or the critical value method? Well, here let's go with the p-value method. We've done this a few times now, so I'll show you again in Excel how I calculate my p-value. Now for a p-value calculation, we remember that we first need to calculate that test statistic from step five. So for my test statistic, I've set this all up. I have N, I have my p-hat value in a non-percentage. I have my p-value from my claim. Again, remember not to get this p-value confused with this p-value. Then I calculated Q by taking one minus P, so that's one minus 0.3, that's 0.7. I set this up very carefully in Excel with all the parentheses in the right place to then calculate Z, my test statistic. For the p-value route, we need this test statistic before we can calculate the p-value. So next what we do is remember we have conditions of a standard normal distribution where we have a mean of zero and a standard deviation of one. 
I'm interested in an area of probability of a range of values, so my cumulative value is also one. Remember, we can use a cumulative value of zero or one, and for zero, we're just looking at one single point of area. But for a cumulative value of one, we're looking at an area that's a range of values. Then the other number I need here is that Z test statistic I just calculated up here. To then find my p-value, I'm going to use that norm.dist function in Excel. So then using my normal distribution function, and I plug in for x, that z test statistic, my mean, my standard deviation, and my cumulative value. I click enter, and then I get my p-value here in this cell. Putting this all together now, the test statistic is z is equal to negative 2.41 when rounded to two decimal places. And the p-value then is 0 0.008. Now I'll also show you how we calculate the p-value using table A2. We've done this a few times, but not with a claim that has a less than symbol. So less than 30% of adults have sleepwalked was our original claim. For table A2 and Excel, we still need to calculate that test statistic of Z. We'll get negative 2.41 again. Here's showing you the full setup, not in Excel. How do we make this more accurate? Well, look here for P hat, we use the fraction form rather than the rounded decimal form. So we plugged in P hat, P from our original claim, P, Q, and then N. So we got our test statistic again of z is equal to negative 2.41. Now the next part of this is understanding the tailedness of the test. So remember from our alternative hypothesis is that p is less than 0 0.30. When we have an alternative hypothesis with that less than symbol, then we know we're using a left tailed test. This holds true for both the Excel method and this table A2 method. Our p-value is gonna be this area here for a left-tailed test. So it's this left tail on the left side of the distribution. So we have a left-tailed test here. This simplifies things a little bit because then when we find this area on the left, we're done. As we saw for a right-tailed test, we needed to find this cumulative area to the left, but then take one minus that area to actually get our p-value. Here for a left tailed test, once we find the cumulative area to the left, that is our p-value. When we go to that negative z-value in table A2, then we find a probability slash area value of 0 0.0080. That's our p-value already because again, we're interested in a left tailed test, so we wanna know this cumulative area to the left. For Excel and table A2, those already give us in reference to the cumulative area from the left. So note this difference here if we're using the p-value method for a left-tailed test versus what we saw before with a right-tailed test. So that was step six using Excel and table A2 and more specifically using the p-value method. Now, when we move on to step seven, we're comparing our alpha value to this p-value. Because our p-value of 0 0.0080 is less than our alpha value of 0.05, then we know based on these guidelines here for a p-value method that we need to reject the null hypothesis. So from step seven, we reject the null hypothesis, then we move on to step eight. The first thing we asked, do we reject or do we fail to reject the null hypothesis? Well, we saw from step seven up here that we reject the null hypothesis. The next question, does our original claim include inequality? Well, we remember that our original claim is P is less than 0.3 or fewer than 30% of adults have sleepwalked. What does this say then? Then our original claim does not contain inequality. For the interpretation, we can go back to this handy table. We know that we rejected the null hypothesis and our original claim does not include inequality.
Therefore, we go to the conclusion that there is sufficient evidence to support the claim that, and we insert our original claim there. For the sleepwalking example then, we therefore conclude that there is sufficient sample evidence to support the claim that fewer than 30% of adults have sleepwalked. Now, the last part of 8.2 is using these exact methods. I mentioned this in the beginning when reviewing those key concepts we're gonna cover in 8.2. So here, keep in mind, we're using these exact methods still for testing claims about a population proportion or P. So let's talk about how to test claims using this exact method now. So what we need for solving this using the exact method is to identify first the sample size n, the number of successes x, and the claim value of the population proportion p. After we've identified those variables, then we find the p value. So instead of finding the p-value like we've done in the chapter so far, we're going to use Excel still, but do it a slightly different way. In this way, we're using binomial probabilities and then these equations. For a left-tailed test, the p-value is equal to the probability of x or fewer successes among n trials. Remember for the sleepwalking example, we wanted to know 30% or fewer. And for that 30% or fewer, that means we had a left-tailed test. So it makes sense here that we have X or fewer successes for our left-tailed test. Then similarly for a right-tailed test, the p-value is equal to the probability of X or more successes among the N trials. For those drone examples, we wanted to know if a majority or most of consumers. So for that, we are working with a right tail test. So again, this makes sense that we're dealing with X or more successes for a right tail test here. Then for a two tailed test, it gets a little bit more complicated where our p-value is equal to twice the smaller of the preceding left tailed and right tailed values. I put in this slide here again as just another reminder of our two-tailed test, our right-tailed test, and our left-tailed test. Let's try an example using this exact method we just talked about. So using the exact method, we'll solve for this. In testing a method of gender selection, 10 randomly selected couples are treated with a certain method. They each have a baby and nine of these babies are girls. We'll use the exact method and a 0.05 significance level to test the claim that with this method, the probability of a baby being a girl is greater than 0.75. Again, we're using sample data here to then make an inference about our population. For our sample here, we have only 10 randomly selected couples that were using this certain gender selection method. But out of those 10 couples, nine of the babies were girls. So then let's proceed using this exact method. We know one of the first important things to do is to assign the notation that we're given in the setup of the question. So here, sample size N, we had 10 couples that were involved in this method. This 0.75, that's the value that's in our original claim. So our claim value, lowercase p, that's equal to 0.75. Then as you may remember with this exact method, we're connecting it back to a binomial distribution. So another step we should do here is to calculate our value for q, where q is equal to one minus p, so that's one minus 0.75, that's 0.25. Now, aside from assigning notation, we also know an important step in the solution is going through that requirement check. Let's start to go through the requirement check now. So as we saw at the beginning of 8.2, that we wanna use a normal approximation. For a normal approximation, N times P has to be greater than or equal to five, as does N times Q. 
Well, as we have such a small sample size of 10, when we take n times q, that's 10 times 0.25. That equals 2.5, and 2.5 is not greater than or equal to 5. That means the requirement here is violated. So for this specific example, we could not use a normal approximation. But fortunately here, we weren't planning on using the normal approximation. We were planning on using this exact method. For the exact method, we have slightly different requirements now. The only requirements for the exact method are that we have a simple random sample. And again, a binomial distribution was mentioned at the beginning of introducing this exact method. So the other requirement here for the exact method is that we satisfy the conditions for a binomial distribution. Let's go through those requirements. So we do have a fixed number of trials. Those trials are independent. We have two categories being a boy born or a girl. And the probability of success remains the same in all the trials. So again, for this example, we could not use the normal approximation method. What we can use is this exact method. So keep in mind for the exact method, we have different requirements that need to be satisfied before we can solve the problem. And for our gender selection example here, these two requirements for the exact method are satisfied. Let's continue on with the solution now for the exact method. Keep in mind for the exact method, we have a different way of calculating that p-value, but we first need to set up this problem the same way we've been doing. That involves deciding on the null and the alternative hypotheses. For the null hypothesis H0, we keep in mind that that's going to have an equal sign. Our original claim is that the probability of having a girl is greater than 0.75. That makes our null hypothesis here, p is equal to 0.75. Not to skip steps one and two now. So our original claim is that the probability is greater than 0.75. In symbolic notation, that would be p is greater than 0.75. The opposite of this then would be that p is equal to 0.75 or p is less than 0.75. In symbolic notation for that, p is less than or equal to 0.75. So here we have steps one and two. Now we can decide on our alternative hypothesis. Remember that will be the one that does not contain an equality. So here p is greater than 0.75 is our alternative hypothesis. Okay, here's what was just mentioned. Here's then our null and our alternative hypotheses. So now for the exact method, we should solve this using technology of some form. And here we're going to use Excel. So in Excel, we're going to use that binomial distribution function that we've used before. So remember that we did not satisfy the requirements for a normal distribution. So it wouldn't make sense that we'd use this function in Excel. Rather, we're going to use Excel's binomial distribution function. Now, what you may remember using a binomial distribution function in Excel is that we still think in terms of cumulative area from the left. So in setting up that function, let's go through some important steps here. In deciding the tailedness of this example, we go back to our alternative hypothesis that P is greater than 0.75 then that indicates to us that we have a right-tailed test. That also indicates to us that we want to know this area here rather than the cumulative area to the left. Coming back to our setup here, we want to know the p-value as the probability of nine or more successes among 10 trials. So this may start to sound familiar because if we want to know nine or more successes using a binomial distribution function, then because we always think in terms of cumulative area from the left, then this is one of the trickier parts here in this setup because we want the probability as the cumulative area from the left, 
we first want to find the probability of getting eight or fewer successes rather than nine or more. So we can kind of think of this as the complement. So the complement to nine or more successes is going to be eight or fewer successes. So let's set this up in Excel. We're gonna use this idea of eight or fewer successes. Again, using the exact method and using this binomial distribution function in Excel, we need our X slash S value, our number of successes. Hopefully this sounds familiar from when we covered binomial distributions. We need N, our number of trials. We need the probability of success or P and we need a cumulative value of one. So to set this up, we type in equal sign B-I-N-O-M dot D-I-S-T for a binomial distribution function. For this function, we need the number of successes, comma, the number of trials, comma, the probability of success, comma, the cumulative value. When I click enter to this, I should get this value here of 0 0.7559748. Let's remember what that is now. So that's the probability of getting eight or fewer successes. What I truly want in the problem though is nine or more successes. So remembering that the total area adds up to one, we can take one minus this value to get our probability of getting nine or more successes among the 10 trials. So I showed this in Excel as well. So I took one minus this value here to get what I was truly interested in, which is the probability slash area value of getting nine or more successes. So to come back to some key points using this exact method as we went through those requirements, remember there are less requirements to use the exact method than there are for the normal approximation method. We also then wanted to figure out the tailedness of our data, which then helped us know we need to first calculate eight or fewer successes. Then we can take one minus that value to get the probability of nine or more successes, which is what we were actually interested in in the question. Our final answer here, we should round off to be about 0 0.244. Let's remember so far where we are in these steps. So we calculated the P value here using this exact method. That was essentially step six. Now we need to move on to step seven and eight and make some interpretation for our question. So what do we know? We know the probability of getting nine successes or more among the 10 trials is 0 0.244. How do we make interpretations when we have a p-value? Well, we know we need to go back and compare the p-value to our original alpha value. So we compare 2.44 to the alpha value of 0.05. From that, we see that this probability of 0.244 is greater than our alpha value of 0.05. Now, this is a case we haven't seen yet. So here, we failed to reject the null hypothesis. Now, how did we get this again? Our p-value, our probability value here of 0.244 is greater than our alpha value. So again, we fail to reject the null hypothesis. I haven't been explicitly labeling the steps here, but we can jump back into step eight and make our final conclusion. We'll ask those same questions. So do we reject or do we fail to reject the null hypothesis? For this example now, we actually fail to reject the null hypothesis. The next question, does our original claim include inequality? Here, our original claim is P is greater than 0.75. So again, our original claim does not contain inequality. We're used to answering this way for this question in step eight. Now, putting those two questions together, we're falling into this row now. So our original claim does not include inequality and we failed to reject the null hypothesis.
With these conditions, then we go to this conclusion, there is not sufficient evidence to support the claim that, and we insert our original claim here. So let's do that. Let's plug in our original claim. Therefore, we say, there is not sufficient evidence to support the claim that with the gender selection method, the probability of having a girl is greater than 0.75. So using this exact method, we ended up saying that we don't have sufficient evidence to support the claim that the probability of having a girl is greater than 0.75 when all those 10 couples use that selection method. Let's think critically here. So does this conclusion make sense given the initial information in the problem? Remember that initial information is in testing a method of gender selection out of the 10 randomly selected couples, nine of them ended up having a baby girl. So nine out of 10 seems like we would get an answer that we can support the claim that more than three quarters or that there is more than three quarters or 0.75 probability of having a baby girl. From our exact method though, we actually can't support that claim. As we just use that exact method and we fell into that conclusion, a conclusion like that is not uncommon. So one criticism of the exact method is that it's too conservative. Another way to think about this in terms of error is that the actual probability of a type one error is less than or equal to alpha, which is the desired probability for a type one error. So in this exact method, we're actually getting less error than we would expect to get with a type one error. That sounds like a good thing to get less error than we would expect. However, that's why this exact method is sometimes considered too conservative. And we saw that as well in our gender selection method. So from the data we were given, we might expect to be able to support the claim, but using the exact method, we don't have enough evidence to support that claim. And as a reminder, in this exact method, we calculated our p-values by using the following different equations. And remember for x or fewer successes or x or more successes, so for all of these, we use the binomial distribution function in Excel. Now, because this method is known to be a little bit too conservative sometimes in making conclusions about our data, we introduce this concept of a simple continuity correction. This simple continuity correction improves the conservative behavior of the exact method. It does so by adjusting our p-value to make it a little bit less conservative. So again, take a look at how we calculate the p-value for a left-tailed, right-tailed, and two-tailed test using the traditional formulas in this exact method. Well, in the simple continuity correction, we have different equations for calculating our p-values. You can see this difference here now. So we'd find this probability, but then subtract one half times the probability of exactly that number of successes. We see that as well for a right-tailed test. Again, these are the simple continuity corrections for making these p-values a little bit less conservative within that exact method. Why does this work mathematically? Well, getting a less conservative p-value would mean getting a smaller p-value. Let me show you this example numerically. So let's say we have a p-value equal to the probability of 100 or fewer successes. Let's say that probability is equal to 0.8 using this original continuity correction equation. Let's then apply this simple continuity correction and see what p-value we get. So now for the simple continuity correction, we still have this portion of the p-value, but now we're subtracting one half times the probability of exactly 100. I just chose 100 arbitrarily. That's our exact number of successes. So in solving for the p-value here, we have 0.8 minus 1 half times 
that's 0.8 minus 0.1 now. So that's a different, smaller p-value. So again, for our exact method, we would normally calculate our p-value in a more conservative way. However, within the exact method, with this simple continuity correction, we can calculate p-values that are a little bit less conservative. So for the gender selection, for example, if instead we use this simple continuity correction to get our p-value, we might then get a different conclusion in the end that makes more sense given our sample data. We're at the end of chapter eight now. I know there's a lot of new material, so please don't hesitate to reach out and ask about any questions you have. To reopen my StatLab assignments, you can always email or Canvas message me. This is limited to two assignments at a time, so you can still focus on the current material that we're learning. For seeking help, I can always help by email, though that's not always as efficient. So know that I'm also available during office hours, and if you can't make office hours, we can schedule different times to meet as well. I hope you're all doing well. Remember that after this, we only have three more sections to learn. So the next lecture recording you'll see is for chapter 10. I'll talk to you all then or sooner.